All right, now we're gonna talk about basic patterns and drawings. So, what are chart patterns? Chart patterns are repeatable structures on charts that give us an indication of the market direction or the psychology of the market. And so, this is useful to us when we're uh, quickly getting an idea of where the market may move. It gives us some context and it helps us develop a plan um, based on how this chart continues to play out. So uh, some, some patterns that we would see commonly are candlestick patterns. Um, there's basic geometric patterns, uh, Elliott wave, Wyckoff, or sort of uh, particular disciplines. Then there's also just the unique configurations that exist uh, that a lot of traders talk about such as triangles, head and shoulders patterns, and um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of different patterns. So some of the caveats, some important warnings before going headfirst into patterns is to understand that patterns are never foolproof. Every single pattern and configuration has a probability of success and a probability of failure. Uh, you really get into trouble when you start to see a pattern unfold and you think that you have a guaranteed knowledge of the way that the market will move. There's so many traders out there. If this was the case, then everybody would be making money practically. Um, everybody that under had a basic knowledge of, of patterns and that's just not the way the markets, the markets work. Uh, and so we just have to be very careful not to think that we know more than we do. Something that's always important to remember is that Following the herd can get you into trouble. Um, it's okay to be a contrarian at times. So let's talk about some candlestick patterns. Candlestick patterns are very powerful. Um, when you look at a candlestick, you'll see uh, the illustration here. You probably want to pause the video at some point and uh, look at this or just Google it. Um, but basically every candlestick has uh, an open and a close. Uh, a body, and then a, um, a shadow, a lower shadow and upper shadow, and the configuration of that can give you in information about, about the direction. Um, so you see here the hammer, the hammer candle, which is the first one, has a very long lower shadow, which is a uh, buying tail and indicative that price has a decent chance of reversing from there. Uh, some of the ones that we'll go over, uh, the hammer, the three white soldiers, you see three uh, green candles in a row, three black crows, you see three uh, red candles in a row. Some other common ones, bearish engulfing, you see the entire movement up was engulfed by a movement downward. Um, dojis are very powerful too, where you see a symmetry of the body and the lower and upper shadow indicative of that uh, indecision in the market and the candle, the candlestick that follows um, can give clarity for the direction. So an example here, we look at this chart and we see um, on the lower area here, we see uh, this, this could be uh, a bit of a hammer candle um, indicating the move downward could reverse, which it does. Uh, we see from there we could say that we see uh, several instances of three white soldiers uh, as well as here we see three black crows. Um, that movement doesn't last too long before we see uh, a doji candle followed by the answer to that which was a movement upward um, which gets engulfed temporarily before continuing the uptrend. So some examples of candles you definitely want to uh, study from a trader that has used these for a while before just blindly using them. They, they do require a lot of context. Uh, some other basic patterns that you might see out there if you just take a look at this really quickly. We see here uh, some common patterns that traders talk about is double and triple bottoms, uh, head and shoulders, inverted head and shoulders. Uh, falling and rising wedges and triangles. And so um, each of these patterns have a typical way of playing out um, and rules to them. An example of that would be the bearish head and shoulders. 
um, you see a lower um, a the left shoulder is lower than the the head and then you see a lower high uh, confirmed in which once you break the neckline of the uh, the previous low at that point the head and shoulders is confirmed and so you would start a short entry the inverse is true of the inverted head and shoulders another example would be the cup and handle uh, in which you see a sort of rounding pattern formed and then you see a, a backing up action happen on the handle and that is often a great entry uh, once you see the bullish momentum continue um, from that handle and so you would take a take an entry off of that uh, the break of that high of that falling wedge um, can be an early entry and a later entry can be once you break the top of the the structure from the previous high same works for the inverse head and shoulder uh, inverse cup and handle as well however um, oh I guess no, yeah yeah uh, so um, some study resources for this would be uh, the Encyclopedia of Chart Patterns is a pretty exhaustive resource talking about various chart patterns, their probability of success, and some examples of them. And so you can just kind of scroll around and look for a very particular situation and slowly learn chart patterns through that. Uh, Elliott Wave is another discipline that looks at um, patterns as well. Elliott wave uh, characterizes price movements as either impulsive or corrective. Impulsive are movements that trend, um, and corrective are uh, the corrections for those those trending movements. Um, and so, in this picture here, we see the market is trending upward, and so you'd say that this is an impulsive movement uh, that has very particular characteristics. Five wave movement. And we have a corrective movement, which is uh, characterized by three, three waves. Uh, we see the market begin to trend, um, trend up again. An impulsive movement, corrective, impulsive. Uh, so it, it helps us understand the phase phases in the market. Uh, some common patterns that take place in the Elliott wave or the impulse wave that we talked about, in which we see five waves: one, two, three, four, five, in which there. Are uh, corrective movements. Uh, there's three impulsive movements. One, three, and five are impulsive, and two and four are corrective. Uh, we have several patterns that are corrective in the in of themselves. The flat, in which we uh, have a corrective movement down, we uh, reach equality, correcting up, and then um, move down impulsively, and that could be an a corrective movement. Any of these patterns could be corrective within the impulsive structure um, or after the impulsive structure. Uh, we have a diagonal, which is um, actually actually the diagonal is an impulsive movement. It's a five-wave structure which can only take place at the, the first wave or the fifth wave, um, and it has a very unique shape and uh, Fibonacci relationship. Uh, the triangle has a unique uh, Fibonacci relationship in which you see uh, lower highs and lower lows, a sort of converging of price action um, to which eventually you get a breakout. Uh, and the triangle can be only in the uh, second to last movement of the series. Uh, we have zigzags, which are uh, more aggressive corrective action in which you can have an impulsive movement down. Uh, corrective movement up and then uh, impulsive movement down. Um, so yeah, these are some patterns that you would get out of Elliott Wave. Uh, Elliott Wave is, is one of my favorite disciplines to practice. And so there's different rules uh, and invalidations. This is an advantage that the Elliott Wave can give you in terms of you can um, constantly be looking at the movements and validating whether it's forming a particular configuration or not. Um, impulsive waves, the second wave cannot go lower than the first wave. Uh, the third wave um, must be stronger than the first wave and the fifth wave. Uh, and it must go higher, that is. And the fourth wave cannot enter the territory of the first wave. Um, some rules for corrective structures are that wave C 
cannot be more than the 1.618 extension of wave A. So if you have wave A here and uh, wave C cannot be more than 1.618 times wave A or else you're dealing with something else, you're dealing with more of an impulsive structure. And so that gives you some insight into what, what you're dealing with there. Some advantages of Elliott Wave, um, as I said, were is that it gives you clear invalidations of when the pattern is, is true or not true. Um, and targets, it gives you great price targets um, using Fibonacci relationships. And also it gives you uh, great market psychological narratives for, for what's going on in the market. So Wyckoff analysis is another form of analysis that I'm keen on. Uh, it gives us a unique perspective of the institutional money versus the retail money. They have very different position sizes, uh, very different risk management techniques, um, and uh, data and expertise. So looking at uh, the market from this perspective can be helpful um, in not getting the wrong side of trades. And you can look at Wyckoff analysis as a, a has a level of conflict theory approach in terms of um, people are trying to essentially for every trade, uh, you know, there has to be a buyer for every seller. So in, in a way, you're naturally in a sort of conflict theory where you're trying to buy low and sell high while somebody else is trying to do the same thing. And so um, obviously everybody can't succeed at that or else to your sell, you won't have a buyer. And then to your buy, you won't have a sell if, uh, if everybody's on the same side of the trade. So naturally we expect there to be a sort of conflict theory in marketplaces. And I think a lot of other forms of analysis miss communicating about this um, as much as Wyckoff does. And so in the Wyckoff price cycle, we have accumulation phases in which large institutions um, can stop the downward movement of price and uh, cause it to kind of go sideways while they level into their positions at which point they can um, pull, pull the market down um, in a sort of spring action, which catches a lot of retail traders off sides and uh, then creates an opportunity for liquidity to enter the market and they can enter uh, the line, line share of their position and push the market up through market orders. Uh, and this is the phase, this then enters the phase of markup in which a lot of the, uh, as you call it, weak hands have left the market, the sellers have left the market. And so now uh, the, the stock is held by um, people that have that don't have the intention of selling it anytime soon. And so the price is then able to move up unimpeded. And so that's why we see these movements, these quick movements up um, when there is a lot of demand, but no supply. And so then um, we see the large institutions ex start to exit their positions in a phase we call a distribution. And so these large institutions, which can't just market order exit a position, they have so much that that in of itself caused the market to, to go down. And so they would get a lower and lower um, price for each of their exits. And so they wouldn't get as great of an opportunity. So what they do is they distribute the, uh, the stock on the market going up. And uh, then this causes the market to sort of hit a bit of a ceiling, um, which has a unique, a unique structure to it called distribution. And so uh, yeah, it starts to form these unique structures and we start to see these strong hands leaving the market and passing their shares off to the weak hands, at which point they can create a spring on the other end in which they catch a lot of liquidity, exit their positions, push the market down, and then we begin a rapid phase of markdown and which people call bear markets. So, um, Wyckoff analysis provides a uh, pretty in-depth look at the different phases of this, of accumulation. You um, could spend hours lecturing and talking about 
the accumulation phase, how does it look in terms of the price movement, in terms of the volume um, levels that are happening at each given moment. Um, but once you start to see this, you can really get a heads up into where the market may be moving. You can see that large institutions are accumulating a particular position and get yourself into that position at the right moment when um, the stock is about to enter markup phase, if you understand the phases of this. And uh, vice versa, you can exit your position at effective times as well when you start to see the, the presence of institutions distributing their stock on the rest of the market. So in closing, uh, patterns reveal the psychology of the markets. Uh, markets are very sporadic and full of different different uh, people, you know, from the retail trader who's, you know, just working their day job, coming home and, you know, day trading. Um, there's long-term investors, there's institutions with big positions. That, um, they're all dealing with different things, but the market has a bit of a collective psychology, which we can start to see in patterns. Um, and so it's important for us to remember though, given all these market participants and aspects happening in the market at one time that markets include a lot of randomness and we can't treat them as completely uh, dependable vehicles that we can just implement patterns upon. We, we Patterns give us an edge, but we can continue this edge if we don't overextend it. So prediction is not enough to be a successful trader. Uh, aspects like risk management and other things help you deal with the uncertainty. And so uh, ultimately a uh, multitude of perspectives is key. And I like to use uh, things like candlesticks, um, Fibonacci's, uh, Wyckoff analysis, Elliott wave. I, I'll be able to look at a chart and see which persuasion or uh, technique is giving me the most insight and combine and mix and mash them in ways that's advantageous to my trading style. So, um, so yeah, hopefully this was a helpful introduction into patterns.